So we are going to begin with the simplest type of uh, structural member, which are tension members. So tension members are structural elements that are subject to direct axial forces, which tend to elongate the members. An actually loaded tension member carries uniform stress. We've seen this in the last lecture. And it's theoretically, it would give a 100% efficiency in terms of the use of material. But practically, the efficiency is less than 100% because of the presence of bolt holes, rivet holes, something called as a shear lag effect that we're going to see in a while, etc. Now, there is a difference between tension and compression. There's an important difference between tension members and compression members. Uh, uh, excuse me for a moment, but there's a lot of disturbance in the voice. Uh, is it that someone's mic is uh, unmute? Can everyone please mute their mic? Oh, uh, we cannot hear you clearly. Is it better now? Uh, yeah, we can hear you now. So, uh, these are the commonly used cross section for tension members. Angle being the most common one, it is mostly used in lightly loaded trusses. If you talk about tubes, it may be uh, hollow circular tubes or rectangular tubes or square tubes. They're mostly used in uh, roof trusses, columns. Uh, and very long span structures. For heavy applications like bridge structures, we mostly used eye sections, channel sections, and built up sections. And uh, sections like rods and bars are used for bracings or purlins, etc. Now, uh, how we compute the elongation of tension members? There was there was a numerical in the last quiz wherein uh, I had given you the elongation and I'd asked you to calculate the load at which it occurs. I think I had even explained you the formulation of this. The formulation is very simple. Young's modulus is equal to stress upon strain. Stress is equal to force upon area and strain is equal to the change in length upon original length. If I just rearrange this, the elongation delta or delta L is equal to PL upon A into E. 
so the entire objective of this exercise is to find out how much load will a particular section carry to find that out first we have to understand what are the different ways in which a tension member can fail in other words what are the different limit states of strength of tension members the limit states uh, of tension members include what are called what are called as gross section yielding net section rupture and block shear failure meaning that if any of these types of failure occurs we see that the tension member has failed or the tension member uh, cannot be used anymore we have to find out how much load can it take now these failures can occur at different values of loads these failures occur at different values of load so if the gross section yielding occurs at a load value of l1 net section rupture occurs at a load value of l2 and block shear failure occurs at a value of l3 what would be our design load anybody we'll we'll get into what these mean but let us just say failure 1 failure 2 failure 3 if this type of failure for a certain say plate section occur at a value of l1 net section rupture or the failure 2 occurs at a load value of l2 and block shear failure or say failure l3 occurs at a value of l3 what do you think will be our design load when i say design load i mean what would be the maximum load that the section can carry will it be the maximum of these three or minimum of these three anybody the maximum the maximum okay any other any other thoughts on this maximum or minimum yes any thoughts yes are you there okay no one else so this l would be the minimum of l1 l2 and l3 that is because we see that the member has failed when any of any one of these have occurred and any one of these would occur at the lowest value say if l2 is lowest of l1 of of these three l2 would occur first or the net section rupture would occur first and we would say that the member has failed and therefore our design load would be the minimum of these three value is it clear we always underestimate our capacity this this we are talking about capacity and when i say l1 it means that it has a capacity of l1 before it can undergo gross section yielding when we are talking about capacities we always underestimate capacity and therefore we are look we have to look at the minimum of these three is it clear are you still in a submission mode Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we are going to look at the minimum value. Now let us look at each of these types of failure one by one. Simple, right? There are three types of failures. There are three limit states of, uh, which means that there are three limit states of strength. We just have to compute the load values of at which these failures occur, and the minimum of these load values is our design load. meaning that that is the maximum load that a particular tension member can carry the first and the easiest type of failure is what is called as gross section yielding now the name itself kind of gives a clue of what type of failure it is firstly it is clear that it is a yielding failure when i say yielding failure what i mean is 
like we are we are talking about this point wherein the member yields this stress is fy so we are talking about this value of stress so what happens here is the gross section or the entire section of a member yields for example if you are using an angle member uh if you are using an angle member as a tension member the entire stress in this angle member will be equal to fy for a certain amount of loading say if this is angle member that is subjected to tensile forces the entire section will have a value of stress is equal to fy as simple as that this is called as gross section yielding now why is it that so yeah, so last time also someone brought this uh, up as to when we say strength what stress we are talking about are we talking about the highest point in the stress strain curve or is it is it something different that we are talking about so uh, although a tension member can resist loads up to the ultimate load by ultimate load i mean this this highest point here that's the ultimate load we denoted by fu okay so principally yes uh tension members can resist loads up to ultimate load without failure but in doing so they elongate by about 10 to 15% of its original length and for this value of elongation what is going to happen is the structure will become unserviceable the deflections would be so large that the structure would be unserviceable at such large deformations and hence this is not the design value of force that we target we target a value wherein the deformations wouldn't be too large and it is and the structure is still serviceable and therefore we target fy and we do not target fu so this is the maximum stress that we say uh should occur in the member when we consider gross section yielding as simple as that now we need to find out the force at which gross section yielding occurs okay everything from basics simple what is force force is equal to stress into area correct we have to find out the value of force what is stress the stress that we are considering here is f y that is our target stress and this is the gross area this is the gross area just to ensure that you have understood what what this gross area means that if this is an angle section and i cut a section here this i can see something like this and this exposed area is the area of cross section okay so if it's a plate section if it's a simple plate section that is loaded if i cut a section here i will see something like this and this is my gross section okay f i into ag now we have seen that we apply a partial safety factor whenever we <clears throat> whenever we are finding out the capacity do we multiply by a partial safety factor or do we divide by a partial safety factor anybody if i this is this is the nominal force if i if i want to find out the design force should i divide it by a partial safety factor or should i multiply it by a partial safety factor multiply okay if i multiply it by partial safety factor what will happen is i will overestimate the capacity if the nominal capacity is say 100 kN okay if i multiply it by a partial safety factor say 1.1 i would say that the member fails at 110 kN what i have done in this process is i have overestimated the strength do we overestimate the strength no what do we do is we overestimate the loads and we underestimate the strength and therefore the right way of doing it this would be if i have a nominal strength of 100 kN i will divide it by 1.1 and then i will get the value of 90 point something and this would be my design strength clear so i will divide this by partial safety factor say gamma and this is the kind of formulation that we 
see here the notations are a little different every notation means something uh, the notation that is used for t t means tension and dg means uh, gross section yielding so t d d stands for design and g stands for gross section yielding so t d g is equal to a g that we just saw into f y upon gamma m 0 now this gamma m 0 is the partial safety factor for failure in tension by yielding if i just go back to the presentation that we saw last time so we had this these, these uh, we looked at these set of different partial safety factors and the one that you see here in number one it is the resistance governed by yielding so whenever yielding governs the partial safety factor is 1.1 And therefore, the formulation now comes out to be Ag into Fy upon gamma m0, where the value of gamma m0 is 1.1. Is it clear? This is the simplest formulation that we are going to see in this course. Next is, uh, uh, are we on the same page until here? Any questions? Anybody? No questions? Okay, moving ahead. So the next type of failure or the next limit state of strength in tension members is what is called as net section rupture. Now, a tension member is connected to the main member or other members by either bolts or welds. When connected using bolts, naturally tension members have holes. Uh, any questions? And these holes reduce the cross section area and this reduced cross section area is called as the net area okay uh, to just put it into a picture so if this is a Late section. Okay, without any bolt holes. So bolt holes at this section, no bolt holes. If I take a section here, it is going to look something like this. Okay, so this is the gross section. If I take a section here, what we see is something like this. So these are the bolt holes. The, the gaps that you see here is because of the bolt holes. And the addition of these three is the net area. Is it clear the difference between gross area and net area? Yeah, yeah. Okay, simple. So because so because of the presence of bolt holes, there's a reduced area, and this area is called as a net area. Now what happens is because of this bolt hole or because of this obstruction to the flow of stress, the points which are just adjoining the bolt hole experience very high stresses. A very common phenomenon. Take an example of a bridge over a river. When you look at that river away from the bridge, you see that the flow is, uh, the, 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 there's no disturbance in the flow. But the moment the water hits the bridge pier, you see that there's a lot of turbulence in and around. So whenever there's an obstruction to the flow of something, this is the flow of stresses. Whenever there's an obstruction to the flow of something, it is going to cause turbulence. It is going to cause, in this case, what is called as stress concentration. The stress is concentrated only at a few points near the bolt hole. Because of this, what happens is, the points which are close to the bolt holes experience very high amount of stresses. And these stresses are about, are about two to three times the average stress. Therefore, 
when a tension member is incrementally loaded say when you start loading a tension member and when you gradually increase the load at every value of load the stress here is going to be higher as compared to the stress at the other locations or at the average stress so for a certain value of t this stress is going to reach the value of yield stress which is fy on further increasing the value of t will this stress value increase any further no because we know that we have hit the flat portion our stress strain curves look something like this so once we have reached this portion this value cannot increase further okay so what happens is this the the stress at this level remains at the value of fy and the yield spreads outwards which means as we increasing the value of t this section is going to experience an incremental yielding the yielding is spreading outward and at a certain value of t the entire net section has yielded okay please note that for this value of load the other section is still elastic it has not reached the value of fy so when you further increase the value of t deformation increase and this section this particular section breaks or this particular section ruptures and this type of failure is called as net section rupture okay uh, to understand it so this is our net section rupture wherein the section along the bolt holes ruptures or breaks simple any questions here so this is just the mechanism this is just the mechanism by which it occurs yeah please go on yeah uh, so um, just to confirm a few things i have a stupid doubt i think um, the bolt holes are where the the bolt will sort of go in right um so do we really consider them as voids because the volume will be filled up later on by the the bolt in place right yeah go on <clears throat> just a minute okay so even though the void will be filled by bolts later on but the way we have to look at it okay okay so the way we have to look at it is something like this now this is a member which i want to say connect to this member okay so what do i do is i uh sort of place the other member below this such that this looks something like this okay now i have to connect them so what do i do i punch in bolt holes something like this okay and now this section is under tension or this member is under tension and this tensile force has to be transferred from this member 
through the bolt hole to this member. Okay. So at this particular section, uh, let us let us take another section. Say at this particular section, the total amount of force that is to be carried is T. Okay, because that is subjected to T. And it has an area of A G. At this particular section, the total force is still T, but the area of the plate which is carrying this is only the net area. Okay, and through this net area, it is being transferred to the bolts at the interface. And then from the bolts, it is being transferred to the other plate. And therefore, though this area is filled with bolts, but the function is different. But the function of this this bolt area is different as com as as compared to the function of this section here. And therefore, we cannot count on these. Our section should be able to sustain this load even at a reduced net section. Uh, net section is overlapping. Uh, net section is not overlap. So if we have to look at the gross and the net section here, if I draw a uh, take section, I'll call this as section one and I'll call this section two. So if I draw section one, it will look something like this. Simple, this is a plate. So this is section one. If I draw section two, it will look something like this. This is section two. Is that clear? Yeah. So, so forget the area of this forget the area of the second tension member. We are just talking about this tension member and how uh, we ensure that it suffices. It is sufficient to take the value of this T. So this is the gross section and this is the net section. OK, did I answer the original question? Uh, who asked that question? Um, I did, yeah. Yeah, I've understood now. Thank you. It was a good question. I hope I answered that question. OK, Good, yeah, so so this is how this is how net section rupture occurs. OK, at the section along bolt holes. Let us look at the formulation again. Very simple and very similar to gross section yielding. Um, So we have seen that force is equal to a stress into area. The stress that we have to consider here is we look at that value. The area that we have to consider is the net area for sure. OK, and the force that we are considering here is F U. OK, so whenever we are talking about yielding, we consider F Y. Whenever we are talking about rupture, we consider F U because this is the maximum stress after which rupture is going to occur. And therefore the stress that we consider here is F U. Then the net area and the partial safety factor here is gamma M one. Uh, again, referring to the last presentation. If you look at number two, the resistance that is governed by uh, ultimate, sorry, number three, the resistance that is governed by ultimate stress, which is gamma one, is 1.25. Is 1.25. Therefore, this formulation is something like this FUAN upon 1.25. This one more factor here, 
Now, if we look at the yield stress, if we look at the yield stress, there is a lot of reserve strength in the material even after yielding. So this is the reserve strength. Okay. And yielding failure is gradual because we know that the material can undergo a lot of deformation after yielding. But if we are considering the ultimate stress, there is no reserve strength after that. And therefore, we have to be a little more safe when we are considering FPU. To give it that extra cushion, what we do is we multiply this by a factor of 0 0.9. What this 0 0.9 does is we are underestimating the capacity by considering only 90% of the actual capacity. Okay, so this 0 0.9 factor is to give an extra cushion because the ultimate stress, after ultimate stress, there is no reserve strength in the material, one. And this type of failure is a sudden failure. The way uh, you, you just saw it, it just, it, just, it just ruptures suddenly. And therefore, to give it an extra cushion, we use the 0 0.9 factor. And that is what we see in the formulation. So this formulation, T, D, N. T means tension, D means design, N means net section rupture is equal to 0 0.9, which is to account for the absence of any reserve strength beyond ultimate stress. The net area, okay, the ultimate stress in gamma M1. Now, this formulation is valid only for plates. Okay, this formulation is valid only for plates. Now, the natural question is, how do we compute the value of AN? We know how to compute the value of AG. It is simply width times thickness. How to compute the value of AN? Okay. So, uh, again, uh, going to our sections. Okay, so if this is a tension member, it has say two volt holes. This is our section number one. And this is our section number two. Section one gives us the gross area of, for that. If I draw section one, it will look something like this. Say the width here is B and the thickness of this section is T. This is section one. And this section two is something like this. This is section two. So AG is B times T, okay? Now AN is the gross area minus area that we have lost here. So I just shade this area. The area that we have lost here. Can someone tell me what this area is? If say dh is the diameter of volt hole, what is this area? Um, dh into the uh, thickness of the plate. Yes. Yes. So it is equal to n times dh times t. Okay, where n is the number of volts. This is equal to B T minus n times of dh times of t. So this is equal to B minus n times of dh into t. Simple. 
and this is the formulation that we see here a n is equal to the total width minus n times the diameter of bolt hole times the thickness b is the width of the member dh is the diameter of hole okay diameter of hole is a little greater than the diameter of bolt naturally because it has to it has to fit in there have, there has to be some clearances so the diameter of the bolt hole is equal to diameter of bolt plus clearances now what are these clearances Yeah. So this is a table, uh, table number nineteen of IS eight hundred, which gives us what should be these clearances. So if the diameter of the bolt is twelve to fourteen mm, uh, okay. For a moment, just forget this portion. Don't look here. Okay, just let let us consider this. So, if the diameter of the bolt is 12 to 14 mm, the clearance should be 1 mm. If it is between 16 to 22 mm, the clearance should be 2 mm. If it is larger than 24 mm, it should be 3 mm. So, the larger the diameter of the bolt, the larger is the clearance that is required. Okay, so the diameter of hole is diameter of bolt is diameter of bolt plus whatever is the clearance. It may it might be one or two or three mm. So please note this. So diameter of hole is a little different from the diameter of bolt. So clearance is, is just offset kind of larger than. The hole should be like one mm larger than bolt if yes. it's yes. twelve mm diameter. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. So the hole should be just one mm larger. That is what is meant by clearance. Okay. Now, this is very easy when we have what is called as chain bolting. This is very easy when we just have uh, equally spaced bolt lines, like you, like the one that you see in the screen on the screen. But Often we come across what is called as staggered bolting. Before that, in this type of in this type of bolting, the net section is same at every line. Simple. If I take it at line one, line two, line three, doesn't matter. The net section is going to be the same, and hence we will have only one value of net section rupture. If we go to something that is called as staggered bolting wherein there is uh, when the bolts are staggered to each other like the example that you see on screen there are different possibilities for the net section example given the next section can occur along path a b c d it can occur along path a b f c d or it could also occur along path H I F C D or A B F J K. So now what is happening is we have multiple possible failure paths. So the actual value of A N that we will consider will be the path that gives us the least value of A N. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. So our failure path here, there are uh, there are multiple possible failure paths. The path that we are interested in is the path that gives us the least value of a n. Right? Because 
the failure is most probably going to occur where the value of a n is minimum. Right? Meaning that the failure will occur along a path that offers least net area. Simple. So now we just have to find out, OK, I know how to calculate the value of net area when there is a straight bolt line. But how do I find out a net area when I have to go along a staggered path? So there's this formulation given by the code to find out the net area in case of staggered bolting. Let us look at this. We are familiar with the first two terms that is B minus N times of diameter of hole. OK. What happens is because of staggering, the path gets some extra length to travel here. And to account for that extra length, we add a factor which is called as uh, which is P square upon 4 G. Now let us look at what a P and G. So P is the pitch and G is the gauge. OK. P is the distance between the bolt holes along the direction of force. You can see this is P1, pitch 1, this is P2. Gauge is the center to center distance between the bolt holes perpendicular to the direction of force. Okay, so this is the direction of force. When we are measuring the distance between the bolt holes along this direction, it is called as pitch. When we are measuring it perpendicular to the this direction, it is called as gauge. So all we have to do is we just have to, this is sigma or the summation sign. We just have to sum up all the staggers that we undergo in this, that we, that, uh, uh, the, that this particular path uh, encounters. Okay. Now, if we have to consider this example itself, the way we'll, we will deal with this is, uh, let us say that we have to find out the net area along path A, B, F, and C. Along this path, we have three bolt holes and it is staggered two times. So we have, say, two staggered. Do you understand? So B, F, and C are the bolt holes, and B, F is one stagger, and F, C is one stagger. Okay. So the net area in this case would be the net area is B, which is the total width. T is the to B is the total width minus n times of bolt diameter. The number of bolts is three. Therefore, three times of diameter of bolt hole. Now we have two staggers here. Okay, stagger one, stagger two. So stagger one gives us P1 square by four times of G1 because the pitch corresponding to that stagger is P1 and the gauge is G1. So four, a P1 square by four G1 plus we have another stagger P2 square by four times of G2. And you multiply this entire thing by the thickness. OK, if I have to. Uh, 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 sorry, I made a small mistake here. This is P1. P1. The pitch and the gauge corresponding to this stagger BF is P1 and G1. OK, and the pitch corresponding to this stagger is P1 and the gauge is G2. Therefore, it will have P1 square by four times of G2. OK, uh, if we have to consider some other path, Say if we have to consider path A, B, F, J, K, we have we still have three bolt holes. 
which is B, F, and J. Therefore, the number of volt holes is three. And we still have two staggers. The first one is B, F. The second one is F, J. So this is correct. The net area in this case is B minus three times of diameter of holes because we have three, three holes. Corresponding to the first stagger, the pitch is P1, gauge is G1, therefore P1 square by 4G1 is correct. But here, corresponding to the second stagger, the pitch is P2 and the gauge is G2. Therefore, we will have P2 square by 4G2. This is how it works. This will get clearer as we solve some numerical examples. See, it has been, I believe that the, this, this portion, like from today's lecture onwards, we are going to look at all the topics that involve solving numerical examples. And I believe this is the part that most of you find challenging. Or this, or you're very comfortable with theory when you, when it comes to, when I ask you to write answers to so say, describe this, describe that. You can use all your creativity to do that. But this is something where you should know specifically how to do it. This is where your guesswork does not um, function. And this is the part which most of you face challenging. Please correct me if I'm wrong. And therefore, it is very important that you pay attention here. That's the first thing. Simple. If you pay attention, you're going to, you're at least, there's a hope that you'll understand. So in this particular arrangement, I know it's very difficult to stay focused for a very long time. But if you have to understand this part, one thing is for sure that you have to pay attention. And the second thing is the moment you do not understand something, ask question because it, it is highly probable that 20 of your friends might not have understood the same thing. And I really encourage you to ask, to stop me and ask at the point when you don't understand something. These things are very easy. Now we are going to uh, we are going to get into uh, a little involved formulations. This is very basic, but I just want to establish one thing. Whenever there is a whenever there is something that you do not understand, stop and ask. Is that okay? Any questions until here? Is it clear? Uh, am I audible? Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so uh, any question? Uh, yeah, yeah, please go on. Uh, uh, why is there the four over there? Like I didn't get that. That's the question. Uh, so this is an empirical formula. Okay. An empirical formula is based on uh, experiments and observations. Okay. So we don't want to get into its uh, its origin or it, its mathematics or its its basis per se, but this is an this is what is called as an empirical formula. So we just it uh, after a lot of experiments and observations, it was found that okay to account for this stagger, maybe if we consider this factor, this gives us a better value of a n. Okay, so this formula is based on a number of experiments and a number of observations. Okay, so that won't change, right? The four won't change. No, this four will okay. this four will not change. Okay. Irrespective of how many bolt holes you have, irrespective of how many staggers you have, this four will not change. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so this was the net section rupture for plates. Simple. Moving on. The yeah. net section. Yeah. Uh, is it Anushree? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please go on. Uh, so I didn't understand how the uh, BFC section is getting cut. I mean, I understood the uh, Anushree, uh, Anushree, please excuse me, but I cannot hear you properly. <laughs> Directly, can uh, you hear me now? Uh, yeah, please go on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I had a doubt in the, uh, how the section uh, through is cut for the B 
FC points calculation. I'm, I couldn't visualize how, it's, uh, we, how we are considering. So, a section, do you mean a section through A, B, F, C, D? Yeah. Okay. So, the failure or the rupture that would occur along this path would look something like this. Okay. And after the rupture, the member, uh, after the rupture, the member would be something like this. Okay. So we are trying to find out the area of this net section here. So there is a bolt hole here. We have to subtract its area. There's a bolt hole here. We have to subtract its area and there's a bolt hole here. The drawing is terrible. There's a there's a bolt hole here. OK, so what we are trying to do is we are trying to find out the area of this section. I'll use another the red pen. We are trying to find out the area of this section. Okay, is this what you are asking, or is this something else? Yeah, uh, actually, I couldn't visualize the uh, sectional plane as such. So right now, I mean, is it like a very staggered section that we are cutting? Yes, we are. So if you if you look at if I draw a section here, uh, this drawing is right now in plan, right? This is in plan. Yes, everything is in plan. Yeah. So do you understand how it will look like if we cut a section here? Yeah, yeah. OK, so it's a, it's a staggered section that we are cutting. Yes, along it's a staggered path. section. Yes, along the path. So this is a failure. Uh, this is a section along the failure path. OK, and this okay. AN is the area of this red line times thickness that you see. OK. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Any more questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So the net section rupture in plates works a little different from the net section rupture in members like angle members, channel members, and so on. Now let us try to understand how. When we have a plate, okay, there is only one uh, element through which the stress has to go. OK. When we have. See an angle member. Considering the example that you see on screen, an angle member that is connected to a main member using only one of its legs. What happens is now. The stress that is flowing through this section now actually has a choice. If it is if it has to travel through the connected leg or if it wants to travel through the outstanding leg. There are two elements here, right? One is the connected element, one is the outstanding element. Similarly, if you would have a channel section, we could just connect one of the elements of the channel section and the other two would be outstanding. OK. If we look at a section which is far away from the connection, this stress will be more or less uniform throughout the section. OK, both the connected leg and the outstanding leg would experience the same amount of stress. OK, now the objective of this connection is to transfer the force that is being carried by this angle member, say P, to the main member. As we come closer to the connection, stresses just like us are very lazy. 
they want to travel to the main member along a path that involves least distance right so you wouldn't expect the stress to go from this point and then up to this because this is the path that i have defined for it to travel so the stress will travel along the outstanding leg until here and then it will get into the connection it does not occur that way what happens is the stress as we move closer to the connection the stress in the outstanding leg tries to converge or tries to concentrate towards the connection which is shown by these red lines meaning that the outstanding leg is lagging as compared to the connected leg in transferring the stress and therefore we have the term lag here we have the term shear because the stress is ultimately transferred from the angle section through the bolt holes to the mem main member by shear now what do i mean by this if i look at this section so though the force that is applied is tension but all of these are going to experience shear i hope you understand what shear is right or how physically you can uh, or how you can imagine shear to occur so these bolts are subjected to shear although you apply tension and we want this force to be transferred from here to here but what these bolts will experience is not tension but shear let me draw a bigger diagram so this is the bolt hole this is the member 1 and say this is member 2 say this is member 2 you are going to apply tension here because of this tension this bolt is going to be pulled here and it is going to be pulled here this action is called as shearing action right so this action wherein if i if i just look at this portion we are trying to shear the bolt right and therefore this effect is called as shear lag effect meaning that the outstanding element is lagging in transferring the stress to the main member through shear this is called as shear lag now why we are interested in this is because at failure what will happen is the connected leg will have relatively higher stresses as compared to the outstanding leg so we cannot say that at failure this entire section will rupture what happens in reality is that only the connected leg ruptures and the outstanding leg partially yields because the stress is less naturally the stress is less it is not going to rupture rupture occurs when the stress along this entire section would reach a value of fu that is the ultimate stress at failure here the stress might be fu but here the stress value would be smaller than fu therefore we cannot just find out okay this is the net area and we cannot use a formulation that we use for plates to find out the net uh, tensile uh, uh, to find out the design tensile force for net section rupture to account for this to account for shear lag effect there is a factor called as alpha okay there is a factor alpha to account for shear lag effect the other formulation remains the same it is an fu upon gamma m1 instead of 0.9 or instead of uh, instead of these 0.9 factor that we have in plates we have in fact we have a factor alpha now this alpha is 0.6 if we have one or two bolts 0.7 if we have three bolts and 0.8 if we have four or more bolts okay now this is along the length of the connection if i look here we have two bolts along the length of connection if i look at the section that is that is that is shown below we have 1 2 3 4 5 bolts along the length of the connection okay so this 
this point this the bolt that we are calculating is along the length of connection now why we have a smaller value for one or two bolts is because if we have only one or two bolts there is going to be a larger non uniform distribution if we have more number of bolts for example you see these two small sections here if we have only two bolts there is a larger stress concentration but if we have say four bolts this shear lag is relatively less and we have a relatively lesser shear concentration and therefore we have a smaller value for one or two bolts and a larger value of four or more bolts this formulation is actually uh, uh, more complex than that uh, there is a simplified one that we are using i'll just show you the actual formulation and uh i think someone's mic is not mute could you please mute it okay so this is the actual formulation so it's a uh, so this particular formula has two terms so this is for the connected leg this is the formula that we are familiar with now because connected leg ruptures we established this and this is for the outstanding leg now to uh, avoid getting into a lot of data what i've done is i've used the simpler formulation that the code gives since we want to keep it as simple as possible we have used the simple formulation wherein these are the values of okay so these are the values of alpha 0 0.6 0 0.7 0 0.8 so that we don't have to get into a lot of data and what the data means and so on so this is a simple formulation the actual formulation is relatively complex okay any questions here is it uh, is it too heavy to understand anybody is it is it very difficult we can maybe uh, do you want me to simplify it further or is this something that that that's fine maybe you just listen to it once you go through the presentation let, later we just solve some numericals and then you believe we can understand this yeah i think maybe if we come back to it and, and like look at it again it, it might make a little more sense or uh, it's yeah. just yeah cool but pay attention if you miss out on why these terms are the way they are it's going to be difficult to remember those it's very it's very easy to remember something it's very easy to remember the value of uh, the this formulation when you know that it is simply based on force is equal to stress into area so okay what stress to consider what area to consider it is this type of failure so what factor will come into picture it is very easy when you understand it this way rather than just mugging up the formula so pay attention the third type of failure is what is called as block shear failure again it's in the name the entire block of the connection sort of ruptures away from the connected member the entire block as a whole is rupturing away now this type of failure normally occurs uh, when uh, thin members are connected by very strong bolts or when the pitch and gauge are very small or the edge distances is not sufficient okay so that is when the block shear failure occurs in this type of failure now in the failures that we have looked before in gross section yielding the entire section yields the entire section is in tension in net section rupture the entire section ruptures the entire section is under tension in block shear failure the, so if this is the failure path these two okay let me mark it okay um so these two paths 
are going to experience shear and this particular plane is going to experience tension. Okay, because this plane is being sheared off. This plane is being sheared off and this plane is under tension. So even though what we applied is tension, but at failure, the planes which are in the direction of the force are going to experience shear and the planes perpendicular are going to experience tension. Okay. So the failure path along the failure path, we have tension on one plane and shear on the perpendicular plane. This is another way. This is just a perspective of how a shear block shear failure would look like. So this entire section entire block of the connection has sheared off. The same thing has happened here. Now, in the first one, first type of failure, the entire section was yielding. In the second type, the entire section ruptured. In the third one, we, wherein we have tension as well as shear, What plane yields and what plane ruptures depends upon how much is that section participating in transferring the load. Okay, just, just pay attention for a moment. You'll understand this. If you look at the diagram that you see on the left side, okay, so we have a larger tension plane and we have a smaller shear plane. OK, so if I apply a tensile force T, a larger portion of this force is going to be transferred by tension because there's, there's, there's more area, there's, there's, there's a larger path, right? So a larger, a larger amount of this T would be transferred through tension and a smaller would be transferred through shear. OK. If you look at the diagram on the right, wherein now the bolt holes are placed close to each other, because of which we have a smaller tension plane and we have a larger shear plane. So when we apply a tensile force of T, a smaller portion of this T is going to be transferred by tension and a larger portion of this T is going to be transferred by shear. OK, established. Now, why do we want to understand what is small and what is large? On the left side, the tensile plane or the plane under tension will transfer a larger amount of force, meaning the tensile plane would experience larger stress as compared to the shear plane. Meaning at failure, the tensile plane will rupture and the shear plane will yield. To understand how the stress is going to look at at failure is at failure, the tensile plane will have a stress of Fu because it is it is transferring a larger portion of the force. Therefore, therefore it is going to experience a larger stress. And these shear planes are going to have a stress of Fy. So the tension plane ruptures and the shear plane yields. That is wherein we have the first possibility of block shear failure. It is rupture along the tension plane and yielding along the shear plane. Okay. Diagram on the right. Tension plane is smaller as compared to the shear planes. Therefore, at failure, the shear plane are going to experience the ultimate stress and the tension plane is going to experience the yield stress. That is where we have the second possibility, wherein the rupture along shear planes. OK, rupture is associated with ultimate stress. Yielding is associated with yield stress. So rupture along the shear 
planes and yielding along the tensile plane. So these are two subconditions in block shear failure. Okay. I know this is this this particular portion might be a little heavy to understand, but let it sink in. Let us look at the formulations. Let us solve a couple of examples and definitely this will be, become clearer. OK, nobody is going to ask you why do we use this formula? OK, so nobody is going to ask you why you, why we use this formula. But you, if you understand how this formula has come, it's easy to remember it. OK. It's easy to remember it. So the first two formulations were very easy. The first one was the easiest. Second one um, involved one more step. The third one is a little more involved. To look at how block shell failure, um, say just just uh, animation of how block shell failure occurs. It is lagging again. Just a moment. There are different different uh, possible failure paths here. There uh, there might be a path wherein the connection goes with the connected member. There is a possibility wherein the connection stays with the main member, and so on. So there are different. It, it just shows the different possible paths. Just to play it again, the first one is wherein uh, the connection has stayed with the main member of the gusset plate. Again in the second one, uh, only the central portion of the connection, uh, only the sec central portion of the connected member has gone away. The third possibility in which the connection goes with the connected member. So these are the different ways in which uh, the block shear failure can occur in a particular member. So now let us look at the formulation. So in tension members, we have only four formulae. The, the one in gross section yielding, one in end section rupture, and two in block shear failure. Four formulas, that's all. Okay. So this is the Thanos of tension members. Okay. So let, let us break it down and try to understand this. OK, so the first type is wherein uh, there's a rupture along the tension plane and yielding along shear plane. OK. So let us break down this formula. Now there is rupture along the tension plane, which means we are talking about net section rupture. Net section rupture means. Oh, what is this? OK, so net. Net section rupture means FU. Net section rupture means. Let's start again. 
so net section rupture means the net area the ultimate stress gamma m1 and 0.9 okay so net section area here the net section area is along the tension plane therefore we will just add a suffix t here okay now gross section yielding gross section yielding so it is gross section therefore we use ag gross section gross section yielding means fy and gamma m0 okay so here the yielding is along the shear planes and therefore we just have to add a suffix v here which signifies shear and we have to add one more term which is square root of 3 which is the failure of stress for shear meaning if you are talking about tension the yield stress is fy the ultimate stress is fu talking about shear the yield stress is fy upon root 3 and this is fu upon root 3 so wherever we will have shear we will divide the numerator by 0 point uh, by square root of 3 so this is our first formulation okay wherein we have uh, yielding in shear and rupture in tension first formulation second formulation wherein we have rupture along shear and yielding along tension okay rupture along shear when we are talking about rupture we are talking about net area ultimate stress and uh gamma m1 and 0.9 0.9 is because we do not have any reserve strength rupture along the shear plane shear therefore i have to add a suffix v here and i have to do a square root of 3 here and yielding along the tensile plane so this is yielding yielding means ag yield stress and gamma m 0 this is in tension therefore we need to add a suffix t here since this is yielding there will be no 0.9 here and this is how we get these two formulae any questions uh, i still have confusion like when it when the specific yields and when it captures the uh, joints and the base uh so the, what confusion do you have uh, one was wide one and one was a bit elongated one. Yeah. okay this one right yeah yeah okay so uh okay uh before that any questions in this formulation are we clear here how each of these terms have come okay great so we'll just <clears throat> okay so if you look at the left diagram what you see is that a larger portion so i'm just drawing a section of of the planes so this this particular plane is under shear this particular plane is under shear this particular plane is under tension okay so the plane which is under tension has a larger area as compared to the shear plane okay meaning that okay this this is just breaking down into very simple terms to understand okay don't take these numbers for real so if you have a 100 kilonewton of stress 
oh sorry 100 megapascals of stress that is to be transferred okay a majority of this say 7 70 mpa would be transferred by tension and then 15 mpa and say 15 mpa would be transferred by shear okay so a larger stress is transferred by tension and a smaller stress is transferred by shear at failure meaning when we have a very large value of load the stress along the tensile plane would have a value of 410 mpa which is fu for mild steel okay and the shear planes would have a value of 250 mp okay this is when we say that the tension plane has ruptured and the shear plane has yielded do you get this one yeah 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 for the other case what you have is you have larger v and you have smaller t you have larger t a uh, larger v and smaller t which means a significant portion of this stress would be transferred by shear um, a significant of the of this stress is transferred by shear and a smaller portion is transferred by tension at failure the stress here would be if u is equal to 410 mpa and at failure the stress here would be 250 mpa for mild steel and that is when we say that tension has yielded and shear has ruptured okay yeah therefore we use the rupture formulation for these planes and yielding formulation for this plane is that clear yeah it's clear any more questions okay so we just have to use a lowest value we have now we have three values tdg tdn and tdb we just have to use the lowest of these we just started with why to use the lowest value right because at the lowest value one of these failures would occur and then we would say that the tension member has failed okay just calculate these four values per se because block share will have two values calculate these four values whatever gives you the lowest value is the mode of failure that would occur okay. now just uh, to look at some miscellaneous elements that i mentioned while explaining this but maybe perhaps you do not know what they mean the first one is what is called as a gusset plate so the orange member that you see here is is what is called as a gusset plate it is a plate which is used to connect the secondary members to the primary members or say beams to columns or cord members to column members now one uh, uh, a couple of a couple of things that we have to pay attention while uh, designing or while fixing the size of a gusset plate is that all the minimum edge and end distances should be satisfied and the second one is that the line of action of all the members should be directed along a single point as you can see on the the sketch on the right the line of action should be at the same point and only that is when the member will be under uniaxial tension if they do not meet at the same line what will happen is there are going to be some secondary moments so simple consideration now just to give an example of how this is done so this is just a video that a friend of mine sent from a site that he was working on wherein this is how these there's no gusset plate per se but then just to uh, show you as to how the members 
or it, it, how is it ensure that the members are concentric or how is it ensure that the members meet at a single point So I hope you get an idea. I'll just pause it here. Yeah, someone had a question. Any questions? Someone wanted to speak up and I interrupted. OK. The next uh, uh, miscellaneous element is what is called as a tension splice. Simple. When we have to connect two members, uh, and that uh, and that situation occurs when the length of the member is less as compared to say the span, or uh, the length of the element is compared is less as compared to the length of the member. Okay, anyway, in that case, what we have what you have to do is we have to connect two members. So one of the ways of connecting them is by covering them with two plates, which are called as cover plates, and then uh, bolting these cover plates. Uh, and the members together, and this is called this is what is called as a tension splice. Spli uh, splicing is just just connecting. We even have splices in rebars. So if you have been on a site visit, you might have seen that rebars are spliced when when say the length of one of the rebar is uh, when the length of the, one of the rebar ends to connect it to another rebar, they are overlapped. So this overlap is called as splice. Now uh, the left. Uh, arrangement is when uh, we have the same thickness. When we have to connect two plates of different thickness, what we'll have to do is we'll have to introduce another plate, which is called as packing plate on the thinner member. And then we'll just have to uh, do this splicing. And the last miscellaneous member is what is called as a lug angle. A lug angle is nothing but a supplementary angle. Uh, which is used when say we have to transfer a heavy force and this length of connection is not sufficient. So this is the main angle member. This is the lug angle member. In the absence of the lug angle member, the entire force in the main angle would have to be transferred say through this length of connection to the gusset plate. If the force is larger, that four bolt holes are not sufficient. What we do is we provide another lug angle which we connect to the main angle and then which we connect also to the gusset plate. So basically we just provide another path for the force to flow. So this is one path to the main angle member. This is another path to the lug angle member. So basically with the use of lug angle, what we can do is we can reduce the length of this connection. For example, in the absence of lug angle, if the connection required say, say seven bolts, say seven bolts and, and that length in, in the gusset plate, with the lug angle, the length of the connection is considerably reduced. So it saves gusset plate length, but it needs additional bolt length. So these are just the miscellaneous members that I wanted to discuss. So with this, we have uh, looked at very basics of tension members. What are tension members? Uh, why are tension members the most efficient members in terms of material use? What are different modes of failure in a tension member? and how to calculate what is the maximum force that a tension member can carry. Now, I believe uh, every year there is at least, <clears throat> there is a question from tension members which carry 10 marks, okay? So this chapter would help you answer this question. And uh, I personally think that this is the simplest uh, topic or this is the simplest question that you will uh, face in the exam. So any questions here?
no questions did you understand everything i think maybe after we go through the presentation we'll have more in depth questions okay no problem so you are always welcome to ask questions in the next lecture provided that you go through the presentation so it's about 10:37 what we'll do is we'll take a small break until 10:45 then we'll finish our um, weekly ritual of having a quiz and then we we'll look into simple numericals for tension members okay do you do you need a break or is it okay if we continue we need a break okay so take a uh, break uh, yeah Also, request can we not have a quiz today since uh, all of us took a night and we don't have energy at all. You took only one night, right? Like you had <laughs> five days before that. See, it's a, it's a. Uh, I know you're tired, but you just have to move your cursor a little bit and just hit a click. Okay. So don't take much efforts. It's an open so. it's an open book quiz you can refer to any side of the presentation that you want okay what will happen is if we just skip it this time then next time we'll study some other topic but the quiz will be of tension member but the quiz will be of basics we'll go to competition member the quiz will be so we lag every time okay so let us get done with this ritual is that okay yeah did you say yeah or did you say no nah? yeah anybody else see if a lot of you if a majority of you don't want the quiz i can consider it um what if we started the next class with the quiz from this time and then ended the class with the next time for quiz like we can study both of these lectures as as together and then so that there's no lag also yeah i think okay. that's a good yeah. idea yeah Okay, but but see, um, okay. So yeah, that is. I think that is acceptable. But again, like I'm trusting you with studying two chapters in one week. Like that's you know that's that's a big trust. So don't break it. Study those those two chapters, and maybe what I'll do is I'll just set it a little little difficult. Okay, because you have two weeks, right? So two weeks for the last topic. So what I do is I just set the last topics quiz a little difficult. Okay, is that okay? But nothing out of what is being taught. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you so yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So thank let you. us get back by ten forty-seven, ten forty-eight, and we'll solve numericals. Okay. I hope you have the habit of taking notes because a lot of what I explain is not in the presentation and take notes while solving numericals it's very important okay thank you
Can you, uh, can someone please confirm if they can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Is, is it loud and clear? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and can you see the board properly? Uh, yeah. Uh, half. We can see half of it. Uh, that's about it. I mean, that's the size of the board. Yeah. Um, you see those white. You see this portion on the left and right, right? That that's that's about it. That's the board. Do you see uh, half of that? Yeah, we can see the extent of it. Okay. Bhargav? Yeah. Uh, we can see the bottom half of the board, not the top half. Okay. Um, That's why we can't see what you've drawn right now. You still can't see it? Okay. Uh, yeah, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> we can just see the bottom triangle. Not the whole yeah. Okay. Uh, so those of you who cannot see it, are you using your laptops or are you using phones? No. Laptop. Uh, can someone who is using the phone confirm if they cannot see the entire board? I can see, uh, I mean, see the entire screen. Uh, the laptop people, uh, what, can they, what they can do is, uh, there's an option of uh, uh, first pin the uh, your your screen then uh, there's an option of fit to frame so you could see okay, the okay. Hmm. yeah got it yeah got it thanks okay thanks for the solution yeah, who was it lalit yeah lalit thank you man thank you very much <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, can we start? <clears throat> Is everyone here? Can we start? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So please write down. Determine the minimum net area. Determine the minimum net area of the plates of the plates as shown in figures A and B as shown in figures A and B with plate size with plate size of 260 by 10 mm of 260 by 10 mm and 20 millimeter diameter bolts 20 millimeter diameter bolts this is figure a wherein a 260 by 10 plate is connected to a gusset plate. I hope you understand what this dotted line means. This is just that the gusset plate is below this plate that we are connecting. With the help of chain bolting, we have these lines of bolts, four bolts in each line. 50 is the pitch because it is measured along the tensile force. 50 is the pitch and 60 is the gauge. Is the text uh, readable? Should I increase the size of the text? No, it's legible. Okay, okay, good. So the gauge is 60, the pitch is 50. Now we have to find out what is the minimum net area, which is the first step when we, found, when we find out what is the uh, net section rupture with the force that causes the net section rupture. Okay, so in chain bolting, there's only one possibility of failure. There's only one uh, failure path. Uh, just give me a moment, you draw this. I'll bring in some colored chalks. Okay, so in chain bolting, there's only uh, one failure path along all these, and that failure path is, say this, the yellow one that you see. Okay, you could have the same path along this chain bolt line or along this line. So what we have to do is we have to find out what is the net section along this path. So we have to find the net section along, say, path one, two, three, four, five, six. So uh, I think someone's mic is unmuted. Could you please mute it? Okay, thank you. The first step is here to find out what is the diameter of holes. What is given is the diameter of bolt. So the diameter of hole is equal to diameter of bolt plus clearance. Okay. Since it is a 20 mm diameter bolt, the clearance that we'll have is 2 mm. If you go if you go to table 19 and see, the clearance is 2 mm. So this will be 220 plus 2, which is 22 mm. 
So this is the diameter of the bolt hole. Now what we have to find out is what is the net area? Okay, net area is we have seen that it is gross area minus area of bolts, which is B minus n times of diameter of hole times thickness. Okay. One thing that I forgot to mention before is that this thickness is the thickness of the thinner member. Example, if this, if the gusset plate is 12 mm, <laughs> or maybe this is not a proper example to give. I've, I'll, I'll get there when, uh, maybe I'll give an example when we have a uh, better example, when we have plates connected to plates or so on. Um, on another thought, okay, this applies, no, this does not apply here. So I'll, just for, for now, just note down that this thickness is, this T is the thickness of the thinner member. So we have V minus N times of DH times T. The width here is uh, 260. We have one, two, three, four bolts. The diameter of each hole is 22 and the thickness is 10. Get the answer. Can someone please give the answer? Uh, 1720. 1720. Any other answers? Okay, so 1720 mm square. Okay. This is the net area. Simple, any questions? No. Okay, great. Okay, I've changed two things here. First is I've changed the arrangement of the bolting. Now it is no more just a chain bolting, it has staggered bolting. And another change that I've done is I've just changed the pitch distances. Instead of both being 50, I've changed one to 55 and another to 60. And this is our diagram B.
Okay. So the first step remains the same. The diameter of hole is diameter of bolt plus clearance, which is again 22 mm. Okay. So previously what we had is we had only one possible failure path which was straight and that failure path would remain same irrespective of which chain uh, bolting that you were looking at. Here, we have a number of possible failure paths. Now, let us try to look at these one by one. So these are possible failure paths, okay? Uh, would someone like to suggest a failure path? Anyone, a simple one. It could be just a straight line. Would someone like to suggest a failure path? One, two, six, seven, eight. Yes. Before we get into a more complex one, uh, let us start with a very simple one. Okay. So we have failure path one, two, three, four. And this path is very similar to some another path, which is 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay. Both of them are straight. Very similar. In this case, the net area would be uh, the width, which is 260 minus how many bolt holes we have. We have two bolt holes. So I'll just write it here. Okay, this is just for your understanding. We have two bolt holes here. So we have uh, two times the diameter of bolt multiplied by thickness. Could someone just please quickly calculate this for me? Two one eight. Two one eight. Anything Zero. else? Zero. Two one eight zero. Okay. If someone finds that there's some discrepancy between what you've calculated, please let me know. Okay. Uh, I think it should be two one six zero. One six zero. Okay. So two one six zero mm square. That's our first possible failure path. Second simple failure path, would someone like to suggest a failure path, a simple one? Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yes, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Please write this down simultaneously, okay? I'm sorry, the board is small. I have to, uh, I'm gonna have to rub it frequently. So five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So we have three bolts in this path, okay? We have three bolts. So instead of this two, I will have three here. And it will be 260 minus three into 22, which is 194. 1940, okay? Now, uh, if you compare uh, case one and case two, it is quite, if you compare the two values, the net area in case two is lesser than that of case one. The reason is simple. We have three bolts here. We have two bolts here. Okay. So the first thing is we have to kind of look for a path that has maximum number of bolts, right? Because that is going to give us a lesser area. This, we are going to do everything because this is just for understanding. See, when, when there's a question in the exam, the objective is not to identify various parts of, or to identify all the possible failure paths, and then do calculations for all of them, find the all net areas and give me the minimum value. The objective here is to just look at the connection, detect which are the potential failure paths, 
which will give you the least possible values of the net area. Okay. Now, if I just look at this connection, I know that 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, 11, 12, 13 will not occur, but 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 might occur because it has three bolt holes. Simple. Now, getting into the paths that involve staggers. Okay. So, would someone like to suggest a path? Perhaps the first one that someone suggested, which was one, two, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, one, two, six, seven, eight, nine. So we have four bolt holes here. And how many staggers do we have? We have only one stagger that is between two and six. So this is just for your understanding, okay? This. This is just for your understanding. So we have four bolt holes and one stagger. So now if I have to calculate the net area, what is the formula? The formula is B minus N times of DH plus summation of P square upon 4G. And I have to multiply this by thickness. Okay, so the width remains same. 260 N. We have four bolts. So four times of 22 plus summation of P square by 4G. Number of terms here would be only one because we have only one stagger. The pitch corresponding to that stagger is 55. So we'll have 55 square upon the gauge corresponding to the stagger is 60. So we'll have 60 and I have to multiply this by the thickness. Can someone please, please give me an answer? Any answers? Uh, 184.6.04. Yes, 184.6 is the correct answer. So we have 1846 mm square. Uh, I had a question. Yeah, please go on. Uh, so, so which part of the formula uh, are we considering for the stack? Yes, like, there's one stack. So. Where, where in which part of the formula is that? This P square by 4G. So this P yeah. is corresponding to this stagger, which is 55, okay. 60, P square by 4G. Okay. okay. Would someone like to suggest a path? One, two, six, three, four. One, two, six, three, four. Okay. One, two, six, three, four. In this path, we have three bolt holes and we have two staggers. This formula remains same. Okay, what is going to change? Instead of this four, I will have three here. And instead of this one term, now I will have two terms. First, corresponding to two six, second corresponding to six three. So the first term is P square by 4G corresponding to 2, 6. The P is 55, G is 60. So we have P 
square which is 55 square by 4 times of 60 plus we have uh, corresponding to 63 again it is 55 so 55 square by 4 times of 60 can someone please give me an answer Mm -hmm. 1687. Just a moment. I college in the commerce. I have a bona fide. 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 I the calling kya? No, I am calling kya. Similar Saturday will come. Ah, no. You talk to them. Who is sitting down? They will talk to you. Ah, no. Actually, I am not in admin. So, you will to talk to some admin staff. Ma'am, call them. Yes, do it. If they will call you, will you give it? Ah, no. I will not give it. Ah, stop. 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 Uh, yeah, so someone had an answer. Uh, 1687.9. 1688. What? So 1688. Can someone please verify this answer? Is it correct? Uh... I think there's something incorrect here. Um, Can I someone else? 2192. Two, two, yes. So the correct answer is 2192. Okay. Now, if you compare case number 3 and 4, you will notice that the value of net area in case 4 is greater. Two reasons. One, Case one had four bolts. Two. Case one had only one stagger. Case four has three bolts, which kind of reduces this value. And it has two staggers, which increases this value. Do you see? So what we are looking for is we are looking for maximizing bolts and we are looking for minimizing the staggers. The larger the number of bolts, the lesser this term is going to be minus this term. OK, and the lesser the value of this. The lesser is going to be this value. Therefore, we are looking to maximize the number of bolts along that path and minimize the number of staggers. Do you understand? So when you look at this, see during exam, you clearly know that one, two, six, seven, eight, nine. When I compare one, two, six, seven, eight, nine and say one, two, six, three, four, I discard one, two, six, three, four because it has only three bolt holes and it has two staggers that are going to increase my net area. I want to minimize the net area. Forget about one, two, six, three, four during exam. Okay, focus on what is possible. Do you understand? That way you could save a lot of time. Uh, would someone like to suggest the next failure path? Um, one, two, six, three, uh... I think eight nine. Uh, based on what based on what I just told you, would you consider one six two one two six three eight nine or would you consider one two six seven eight nine? Um, six seven eight nine. Yes, because um, less number of staggers. Yes, though the number of bolts are same. But what happens is in the path that you just suggested, we have one, two, 
three times that we have a staggering arrangement which will increase this value right instead of only one term in 1 2 6 7 8 9 we would have three of these summation terms in 1 2 6 3 8 9 9 right and therefore we would kind of save our time and not go along this path okay would someone else like to suggest something suggest a failure path okay what about 10 11 6 7 8 9 possible all right this will be same as the first 1 2 6 7 8 9. no because here we have 55 here we have okay. 60 hmm. right so the next possible path is 10 11 6 7 8 9 wherein i have four bolt holes and one times the arrangement is staggered okay So I will have only one term here. I will have only one term. Okay. So just let me write this again to avoid any confusion. The formula still remains the same. The net area is equal to the width, which is two sixty minus n is four here. Four times twenty-two plus summation of p square by four g. I will have only one term here, and that term is p corresponding to this is sixty. So sixty square four times of gauge is also sixty. Sixty. Would someone like to help me with the answer? One eight seven zero. One eight seven zero. Would someone like to just validate this answer? Yeah, it's correct. Yes, one eight seven zero. One eight seven zero mm square. Okay. Now, can you please compare case number five? against case number 3 case number 3 was 1 2 6 7 8 9 case 5 is 10 11 6 7 8 which of those has a less lower value the first one yes 3 case number 3 right why does case number 3 has a lower value because of a lower pitch okay because this value is lesser therefore this term is lesser therefore we have possible failure path is 1 2 6 7 8 9 as a lesser value okay any more paths so uh, to conclude that whenever you have a same kind of arrangement from two sides go for the arrangement that has a lesser value of pitch you might want to write this down okay the lesser the value of pitch for the same value of gauge is okay if the value of gauge is are different it's a different calculation but if for both these paths you had the same value of gauges same number of bolt holes the only difference was one had a smaller pitch one had a larger pitch to save time just select the one which has a smaller pitch and you could just solve it in a couple of steps okay now when we compare all these cases before that would someone like to suggest one more path what about 1 2 6 12 13 do you think we should consider that while solving no because it had two staggers and uh, three yes because only three bolt holes and two staggers so no we are not going to consider it and um, how about 10 11 6 3 8 9 
10, 11, 6, 3, 8, 9. Again, a no, because though it has four bolt holes, but it has three times the range when it's staggered. Therefore, we want to maximize this and we want to minimize this. So wherever in whichever arrangement you get this maximum, this minimum for the same conditions, we'll have that as the answer. So finally, what is the net area? So now we have considered five possible cases and we don't think that any other case, although there are a number of cases, but we don't think someone, uh, the other cases are going to lead to a lesser value. So what is the final value of net area? Okay, so it is minimum of the net area from cases one, two, three, four, five, which is case three, which is one, eight. What is that value? Four, one, six. eight, four, six mm square. And this is our answer. Okay, so this is just like a puzzle wherein you just want to minimize the number of attempts that you want to make to calculate this. So you just use a couple of uh, thumb rules to do it. This, we did it this, we did this the hard way because we just wanted to understand what is the difference between the different parts we select. What is the criteria that we should consider to kind of select our failure path and minimize the number of operations. Okay, so any questions here? Okay, cool. No questions. So write down another question. Determine the design tensile strength. Determine the design tensile strength of a plate of a plate 160 by 6 mm, 160 by 6 mm connected to an 8 mm thick gusset plate connected to an 8 mm thick gusset plate using 16 mm diameter bolts using 16 mm diameter bolts. Consider FY, consider FY is equal to 250 MPa megapascals. Consider FY equal to 250 MPa and FU, FU, is equal to 410 MPa. So the edge distance is 30 and the gauge is 50. Then the end distance is 30. And the pitch is 40. So the total width is 50, 50, 100, 160. One sixty mm square. So we have to find out the design strength. 
we have to find out the design strength. Now we have seen that the design strength is minimum of the design strength due to gross section yielding, the design strength due to net section rupture, the design strength due to block shear. Okay, so we are going to do, we are, we are going to find out these three values and we are going to choose the minimum of these, which will give you a value of TD, which is the maximum load that this particular connection or this tension member can carry. Okay, so we stop here for now. We will continue this in the next lecture. Before that, please do not log out. I just want to connect to my laptop and record attendance. By the time, if there are any questions, uh, you're free to ask. Um, any uh, questions? What, what did you write here at the top? Like, uh, what are the terms? But I'm not actually this is it. So TD is minimum of TDG, which is the design tensile force for gross section yielding. Then TDN which is a design tensile force for net section rupture and TDP, which is a design tensile force for block shear failure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I I guess that's it. Okay, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So that's that's it for today. From next time, uh, it's a huge relief for you guys that we are going to have only a hundred minutes lecture. So perhaps we'll be able to focus more in these hundred minutes and get some uh, important numericals done. So that's it for today. Thank you for your attention and your patience. And please, please go through the presentations. The last two presentations were very important. Uh, and we'll have a quiz next time. We'll have only one quiz. I'll include the content from today's as well as last lectures. Uh, and please go through the presentations. Please study. And uh, hopefully you'll do well in the next quiz. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'm here for a couple of minutes. Else you can sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.